Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. I'm the Reverend Dr. Jamie Mathias, pastor of Holy Family Catholic Church in Austin, Texas. Do we all know the children's song, Ring Around a Rosie? How does it go? Shall we try singing it together? Ring around a rosy, a pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. By the end of the 18th century, children were singing Ring Around a Rosy, and the song was first printed nearly a century later in the 1881 edition of Mother Goose. A half century after that, after World War II, people began to believe that Ring Around a Rosy actually described the effects of the Great Plague of 1665. Think about it for a moment. The words ring around a rosy supposedly describe the rosy rash that accompanied the plague. A pocket full of posies? Well, people may have used such flowers to ward off the plague or to keep from smelling the stench of those who had died from the plague, or perhaps the dead were even buried with posies in their pockets. And the final symptom of the plague was sneezing or coughing which is why the original version of the song didn't say ashes, ashes, but achu, achu. Changing the word to ashes made sense, though. It could have referred to the blackening of the victim's skin, the cremation of the victim's body, and or the burning of the victim's plague-infested home and goods. And we all fall down that was a reference to people falling down dead. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That's what today's celebration of Ash Wednesday is all about. The ashes we receive today remind us that we all fall down, we all die. Have you stopped to think about it before? Why do we use ashes on Ash Wednesday? Why don't we use mud or some sort of makeup or cream or why don't we simply use permanent markers to draw crosses on people's foreheads? Or why don't we simply sign ourselves with holy water? Imagine that we could start Lent with Water Wednesday instead of Ash Wednesday. Why ashes? Where do ashes come from? Ashes come from things that have died but have been burned. If we cut down a tree and burn it, what will we have? Ashes. And can we change those ashes back into a tree? Never. In science, we call it a chemical change. It's irreversible. A tree that has been burned is dead forever. Ashes, then, are a symbol of death. They remind us of our mortality. Perhaps some of us are old enough to remember the words the priest used to say when he imposed the ashes on our foreheads. He would say, Remember, mortal, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That is, remember that you will die. Ash Wednesday then brings out the existentialist in each of us. Existentialists believe that every day is a day closer to death, and ashes remind us of that existential truth that each one of the seven billion people on this earth today are one day closer to death, that each of us in this room will one day die, that you will one day die. Fortunately, as Christians, we don't believe in death. For us, death is simply a doorway through which we all pass. And for centuries, people have believed that beyond that doorway of death, await various options, including the options of everlasting life or everlasting death. So what are you doing today to prepare yourself for that day in which you yourself pass through that doorway? During the 40 days of Lent ahead of us, our attention will be focused on three practices that might help us to better prepare ourselves for that day in which we all meet our Maker. 
In today's Gospel, we find the scriptural basis for those three traditional Lenten practices, praying, fasting, and almsgiving. Through prayer, we focus on our relationship with God. By fasting, we deny ourselves of something that we enjoy. And almsgiving simply means that we live generously, sharing with those in need. These three things help us to focus on God and others. They, they keep us from believing that we are the center of the universe, that we should indulge ourselves, or that we have no responsibility to help those in need. They get us to turn toward God and others. And are we supposed to do these things, praying, fasting, and almsgiving, so that others recognize us and congratulate us? Not at all. Today's Gospel clearly indicates that we're not supposed to do these things in order to bring attention to us, but in order to grow in our relationship with God and others. They're meant to help us turn toward God and toward those around us. In today's first reading, the prophet Joel talks about one of these three practices, fasting. In today's first reading, God speaks to the prophet Joel saying, Return to me. We've said many times that we are taking many of our Sunday readings this year from the Gospel of Luke. Joel's words bring to mind that famous parable in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the prodigal son. According to the story, a son turned his back on his father and went off to a foreign land, a faraway place. You can imagine the father in the story calling to mind Joel's words to capture his most earnest desire for his son, Return to me. And when the prodigal son returned home, how did his father respond? The father welcomed his son with open arms. That's the image of God that the prophet Joel shares in today's first reading. Joel tells us that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, rich in kindness, and relenting in punishment. God is not waiting to scold or smite us. God is waiting to welcome us home. And so in today's reading, we hear that the people proclaimed a fast, that they focused on their relationship with God and others, and that, as a result, God relented and showed compassion for the people. St. Paul tells us the same. In today's second reading, his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul simply says, Be reconciled to God. We recall that the English word reconciliation comes from a Latin root, reconcilium, which literally means to turn around and be eyelash to eyelash again. That's what the prodigal son did. Even though he had previously turned his back on his father, he turned around eyelash to eyelash again with his father. That's what the people of Israel did in today's first reading. Though they had turned their backs on God, they turned around to be eyelash to eyelash again with God. So, remember the Ash Wednesday message, that one day we'll all die. And on the day you die, do you want to have your back to God? Imagine that, dying with your back to God so that God couldn't even recognize you? Or on the day you die, do you want to be facing God, looking at God's face, gazing into God's eyes, and hearing those words, Welcome home. Ashes ashes, we all fall down. Sisters and brothers, each of us will one day fall down in death. Each of us will die. On the day you die, in which direction will you be facing? If you've turned your back on God and or on others in the past, perhaps the ashes you receive today might be a reminder of the fact that it's time to turn around. It's time to be eyelash to eyelash again with God and others. It's time to be reconciled before it's too late.